welcome also Dave from PS Nation. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate you guys having me on. It's it's an absolute honor and thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to be here with us and to talk about Destiny and video games. Yeah, and, definitely not a problem. Yeah, and for anyone who does not know, Dave is a Destiny fan who shares a passion for video games, sports, and softball. He also owns a PS4, PS3, and a Vita, and he is the co-host of the longest-running PlayStation podcast, PS Nation. Yeah, uh, I haven't been hosting it the entire time, or co-hosting it the entire time. I took over about 18 months ago. Yeah, um, the Glenn uh, Percival, he'd been, uh, the, he's the founder and the editor-in-chief for PSNation.com, and he retired from podcasting in January of 2018. So, and myself and Michael uh, came on and to continue the show's trend, and we uh, and Josh Langford stayed on with us as well. That's pretty cool. I just bought two PS Vitas because I, heard, I, I <laughs> production. heard that. Yeah, yeah production yeah. is over in Japan. So before they became scarce, I made sure to snag a few. Yeah, they're, they're a fun, interesting system. You can remote play with them and things like that. So a uh, little yeah, hit or miss, a little, you know, miss potentials for some certain things on there. But some yeah. hidden gems on there, though. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's an it's an indie mega machine, and there's some great, great games on there. So, like, great mm -hmm. games. So. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate the PlayStation platform. We actually started playing Destiny 2 on the PlayStation 4, and we migrated to PC as soon as the game came out for PlayStation, and we discovered the land of unlimited frames. <laughs> But it's always great to come back and play with friends, and I recently got a PSVR, and let me tell you, that thing is freaking cool. I absolutely love playing Beat Saber on it. Yeah, I don't have Beat Saber. I've heard some really good things about Beat Saber. There's some, I've got a VR as well. There's some great, great games on there. Like Moss is, is really good. Uh, Firewall Zero Hour for shooter fans is really good. It actually just won... Um, a game, a multiplayer game of the year for our website's Golden Minecart Awards that we give out every year, uh, that are voted on by the community. And um, the uh, shoot, what was the other one? There's another one. Um, Astrobot. Yeah, that one. So. <laughs> yeah, I heard that one's really good. Yeah, yeah. Astrobot won overall PSVR game of the year for our Golden Minecarts. So. Yeah, Astrobot is a pretty amazing game as well. It's so reminiscent of Mario. Or like your typical Nintendo game, but with a PlayStation twist to it, mm -hmm. and it's it's such a great game to play. There was another one, I believe it's called Hot Hot Shot VR. Super hot. Super, Super hot. hot yeah. There we go. Super. Yeah, you can like that's like a kind of like a strategy kind of shooter game. Like you can freeze the game and like set things up and then do things with it. So like set up uh, scenarios or put things in certain positions and then like and then unfreeze it and watch it like execute. So. Definitely. Yeah. And I I did actually also do a little experiment and I tried to play Destiny in VR. It didn't quite work out like I expected it to, but the possibility of that being a reality maybe in three, four, five years, that's kind of cool, actually. It puts it, like, in theater mode, doesn't it? It does, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's actually a really cool way to watch movies. A lot of people don't know that uh, PSVR is actually a 3D... It's a it's a, a 3D movie viewer as well. So if you have 3D, uh, PS4 supports 3D movies. If there's a movie that you have 3D, you don't have to, have to, have, to have the glasses. You can just put the, the headset on and watch a movie in 3D. That's really cool. I'll have to check that out. Any uh, specific movies you recommend checking out oh, in uh, VR? Not that, yeah, not that I can think of off the top of my head. So anything that supports 3D. They, they Probably would, Avatar. It, yeah, mm. it would work on the in the VR mode. So it's kind of cool, too, because like, depending on your situation with how many TVs or you do or don't have, you could be watching a movie and your significant other could be watching something on the, t on, on the regular TV and you could just have the, um, the, the headset on and you guys could watch like two separate shows. That's a good idea. <laughs> I never thought of that. Got a wife and three kids. I got to do what I can. So. <laughs> That's understandable. Now, Dave, how did you get started in the games media industry, and how did PS Nation get started? 
Um, PS Nation got started way before my time, um, and it it mainly started off as like a podcast back in the like the uh, there was a group of people that were part of um, VGEVO VGEVO dot com. Um, it was a uh, back when forums were like a really really big thing. There was just this huge community that was hanging out in the forums, and they had all these different. Um, for uh you know sub forums and stuff like that they had playstation they had xbox and over time people were communicating back and forth in the forums and then they just decided to start a podcast and so they were doing the podcast and they did a playstation centric one uh, again like i mentioned glenn was is the is the owner and the founder of psnation.com along with the podcast and he really started podcasting mainly to learn to edit audio like he wanted to learn how to edit audio and so he got you know through a couple different microphone changes and some mixer changes and things like that that he did he ended up getting really good at at it and the show slowly grew to where um joystick.com actually came to them and had them host a playstation centric uh podcast for them their the podcast was doing okay before then but that was kind of really like the liftoff point for it and then the website came a little bit afterwards and writing reviews and posting news and impressions of things and and then stuff just it just grew over time from then that they were able to go to you know they glenn and josh went to e3 years ago like seven eight years ago and then over time as the site grew to be bigger and bigger we were able to take more and more people and we actually take a team of anywhere from five to six people to e3 every year now wow so this was during the ps3 um yeah Days. Yep, it started definitely at the like right at the launch of PS3 is when it started. Um, it's like uh, 11 and a half years old now, almost 12 years old. Um, so like the like I said, the podcast has been we're up to. Um, I'm actually editing episode number 615 this week. Oh my god! <laughs> wow. <laughs> Um, and Pass the show, off to you. That's the, awesome. Well, I, again, I have I not even a, I'm not even at like 70 episodes myself. But um, the they went. I don't know the exact number. I don't have it in front of me. But up in, about three years ago, due, just due to some some uh, family uh, issues that everybody was going through at a, the the times lined up at around I want to say somewhere between five episode 540 and 570 is when they missed their first week. Wow. So other than that, up to over 500 episodes, they hit every we we hit every single week. That's remarkable. That's that's pretty incredible. That is dedication right there, and a lot of respect for you guys. That's really really awesome. Hey, we're happy to have you on at number eight. So. <laughs> No, it's awesome. I mean, just it, networking is always a big deal and, and growing and, and changing things. I've learned like so much in the last year myself just through like trial and error and everything like that and what works and what doesn't work and feedback and, you know, negative feedback and positive feedback. So it can always go. It's kind of funny how each one of those can kind of play with your play with your emotions either way. So and what would you say is the most exciting part about your job as a host i i'm a co-host on the podcast i don't really run the site um i i post reviews on the site i do i do news periodically i do a lot of streaming on twitch um on our twitch channel and um the probably the coolest thing about this um contrary to popular belief like what a lot of people think i am i i have a regular day job i'm a retail manager um so i still put in you know 50 hours a week and like i mentioned earlier i have a wife and three kids um but I am able to maneuver my schedule around and do certain things to where it's really cool when I get to go to events, like whether it's E3 or was when I got to go to PSX or when I get to go when I got to go review Destiny 2, when I got to go to Seattle and spend two and a half days at not you know right near Bungie Studio. I got to go to Bungie Studio, um, nice. but I was in a, I was in a hotel room or when Ubisoft is kind enough to let me cover Far Cry or Division. Um, you know, or just any of those things, getting to see things at E3, going to Sony press conferences, like it's, I'm 35 years old, but I'm still like a giant kid at heart. And I still get giddy when I see trailers and I still get excited about video games and new games. And I still like everybody else, I buy a game and then complain about not having anything to play. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. I haven't felt I haven't never I've I've refrained from falling into the PC world because I've heard about like Steam sales and stuff like that to where like you all of a sudden oh you have God. like seventy games in your Steam log. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad. Oh, yeah. It's real. I, bad. I can relate to that because I subscribe to the Humble Bundle each and every month, so that adds about seven to eight games to my collection each month. 
And since Destiny 2 came out, I think I've accumulated at least 150 games for the PC on Steam alone. So I can very much relate to that. And then I also have the Nintendo Switch and the PlayStation. I still have to beat God of War. I know it's been oh, man. the longest time. <laughs> such an incredible game. And I still have such a big backlog of video games that I have to go back and play through, like the Uncharted series, uh, The Last of Us. I still have to finish. I love that game so and, much. Uh, yeah, it's so so such a great game. Games. Like all those games you just listed have won multiple awards on our on our site for years. Last of Us got award just one game of the year for overall game of the year for two, 2018. Uh, Last of Us remastered or Last of Us and when it came out on PS3 won an award and uh, won multiple awards and then Uncharted as well. As, those are like those are staples and they are like top top list of must play games. Um, again, obviously it's I don't own an Xbox um, and so I've had PlayStation for quite a while, but those are top top tier like the Sony's Sony first party games are top notch. So. What was your favorite game you reviewed? Favorite game that I reviewed. Um, shoof. For your favorite review. Uh, I don't really know. That's hard. That's, that's a tough yeah. one. <laughs> the, 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 yeah. For a game that I reviewed. Um, Cause a lot of times I, for the, until recently I wasn't, the, the top of the food chain when it came to reviews so it's like not that we got like second hands but you know like the podcast host always kind of got priority over things but you know games that like impacted me the most like Last of Us is is, is a great game like I, I tell people the story all the time like my wife um, any Naughty Dog game like Uncharted 1, 2, 3 and um, and uh, four, and then Last of Us are all made by Naughty Dog, which is a Sony-owned studio. Um, so mm-hmm. she started watching me play certain games, um, and she almost kind of treats them like movies. So she loves the Uncharted series, like the Nathan Drake stuff and everything like that. And we were playing Last of Us when it came out on PS3. Um, I was playing it. She was watching it, and we were going through it. And um, it was getting late. It was like a Saturday night or something like that. And I mean, Last of Us is probably like I think seven years old. I'd have to look, but it's been uh, out yeah. For, yeah, it's, it's 2013, so it's yeah. six years. Actually. Yeah, so like I, we were, you know, I was in my late 20s, um, you know, and we were. I was playing, and my wife was watching, and she's, you know, into the story, and she's helping with some of the puzzles and stuff like that. And it's like 11:30. It might even been later than that. Like might have been like one o'clock in the morning, and I, I got to a point where I'm like, I save the game. And she saw the progress on the, you know, on PS3 when you would save a game, it would say like 71% complete or 82% complete or whatever it was. And I don't remember exactly what the percentage was, but she's like, look, you're almost done. Just keep going. And I'm like, I, I don't think I'm almost done. And she's like, it says like 80% or whatever it said. And I was like, I was like, okay. She was so interested in that yeah. game. We yeah. ended up staying up until like seven o'clock in the morning. Oh yeah, yeah. That's I, awesome. I played. I played the game through the whole night, and you know, and then we and so we got a. I got a very. I mean, I think I didn't have to work like the next day or anything like that, which is kind of why she's like, well, you know. But she, we, I, we were almost done, and that was like another five or six hours of gameplay that I still had. <laughs> yeah, because when you think that game's about to wrap up, there's always there's some things that happen at the end of it, and it's yeah, like, it's 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 super great storytelling. Shadow, have you beat it? Yes, I beat the game and the DLC, and oh, it's cool. phenomenal. Very cool. Yeah, it's yeah. a great game, and the second one's coming, hopefully coming out this year. Yeah, I hear, I hear that. Twenty nineteen. Might... Yeah. Yeah, it's it's going to be really exciting to play through the new Last of Us game. I did watch the trailer. I believe it was at the Video Game Awards, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they had a really big trailer at E3 this year because, like, where they did like the whole. Uh, the whole church like a uh, like that church but it looked like a church like a yeah had a, like a bar scene you know things like that where they were trying to develop the story and and aging the showing showing ellie's age as she's gotten older and things like that yeah i think that's where i saw that it was at e3 yeah yeah that's going to be a really exciting game to play and ps5 is hopefully coming out by next year <sighs> Yeah, I mean, they Sony's pulled out of E3 entirely this year, so that's a different. That's going to be a little bit of a different dynamic. They're not going to be in Los Angeles at all um, around E3. It's also the 25th anniversary, 
20th or 25th anniversary? You're right, 25th. PlayStation. Yeah, 25th anniversary of PlayStation. 94 in Japan. Yeah, and so there's been a lot of speculation. They can't. They they didn't cancel. They didn't have a PSX last year in the in the in the winter like they have in the last couple of years, and they're not going to be at e, at E3. So it's it's good and bad. Like they're building excitement, but they it's also allowing Sony to control the environment. Like they can they can decide when and how they want to present whatever they're going to present. I also think that Sony has gotten quite a bit of bad press as of late, so they're trying to let that all settle before they try to get back in the spotlight, uh, because I know that there was a lot of controversy about Fortnite and everything that happened mm-hmm. with that, um, and then also with their cross-compatibility and how they play with other developers. That's been a questionable thing. Yeah, I mean, they've made some, you know, they, they've made a lot of correct decisions over the life cycle of PS4, correcting a lot of things from PS3 that they initially uh, fumbled with and, and, and eventually fixed with PS3. And then, obviously, they made the correct decisions with PS4, and the sales numbers speak for that um, substantially, almost almost a three-to-one ratio. Might, might be getting a little closer now as, as Xbox is ramping it up and trying to fix, you know, backpedal or fix from their things from earlier from the launch of the Xbox One. Um, but yeah, like some of their some of their decisions are a little bit head scratching. Some of the things that they've not they're not speaking about or they're not you know being as transparent as they used to be are causing some things. Uh, I mean, I have my own in, in um, ideas about uh, crossplay and how it should or shouldn't work. And you know, like right now, I don't really feel like. It benefits Sony in any way to offer crossplay to its players to to allow somebody to, especially with a game like Fortnite, which is free to play. And if um if you're play, if, if somebody's playing it on PC, the expectation that you take something to PS4 and everything that you purchased on PC should just be playable on PS4 and usable without on Sony servers without any financial implication for Sony, I think is a little ludicrous. If it's a game that you pay for. Uh, that's not free to play and it's not you know that that kind of gets into a little bit of a different scenario in my mind in terms of crossplay and things like that like if you have to buy like minecraft or something like that if you buy minecraft on the switch and you buy it on ps4 i feel like you should be able to move your stuff back and forth um because you bought it on sony's platform and you bought it on nintendo's platform i don't think you should have to buy the same thing twice especially when those microtransactions benefit directly benefit the developer or the publisher that's why I want it in Destiny, like so bad. I mean, yeah, at least uh, cross At least I think, yeah, yeah. I think that I know that you, you with the preliminary show notes you sent me had that question in there. Um, I think that with Bungie being an independent studio now, um, you you might see it, but I don't think we'll see it until D three. That's D three. Yeah. 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 I agree with that. I think and it would be cross. It would be cross save. It would. I don't think you would. Uh, with the frames and the different, you know, different operating systems and stuff like that, I don't think you'll really ever be able to see cross play. But um, it's possible they can hit sixty on the PS5 for D3. I think they can. They yeah, I, I, uh, they should. I mean, they should, like 60 frames, whatever version of 4K they're shooting for, but 6, 6, 1080p, 60 frames a second should be a guaranteed lock on next gen consoles across the board. Yeah. If not, then they just don't need to bring them out yet. <laughs> the, the 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 popular belief is that it has to be 4K, and the the amount of people that own 4K devices and things like that is very slim. So. Yeah, it's still kind of in its infancy still. 1080p, bit. 60 frames is hard enough for developers to hit consistently. If you ever watch um, anything like on Digital Foundry and stuff like that, you'll see that even p- companies that advertise their game being 60 frames usually runs at like 50 or 52, you know? Mm-hmm. Definitely. Now, what do you enjoy most about Destiny? Um, that's a really hard question. I was uh, my wife was driving somewhere today, and I was I was with her for a little bit, and I was reading through some stuff, and I was trying to think about that. Um, Destiny as a whole, the franchise changed changed my life and my gaming perspective so much that it's really hard to say. I've got a friend of mine that's in my clan um, that uh, that I play with on a very regular basis. Um, I've never met him in real life, but I, he, him and I are probably best friends. His name is Johnny as a boy. Um, and we have spent countless hours together and the friendships and the camaraderies and things like that that I've made and built up through playing this game with people over the last four years um, cannot be replaced. The opportunities that this game has presented me of being able to interview Deej and interview Eric Osborne and um, multiple other people. The, the story that I tell people all the time is it was my very first E3 that I was able to attend 
and it was uh, when Taken King was announced. Um, and I had I had purchased Destiny, original Destiny myself. I was kind of on the fence about it. I wasn't sure if I was or wasn't going to like it. I kind of enjoyed the alpha. I wasn't really into first-person shooters as much then as I was, like, third-person games like Uncharted and Last of Us and everything like that. But And I had never, ever played a single minute of a Halo game, ever. So I did not know um, any of the, you know, of Bungie. I mean, I've heard of them, obviously, and I had heard of Halo. But so, you know, like they, I got hooked into Destiny. I did Vault of Glass with, with my, you know, couple friends of mine and stuff like that. And that loop kind of like hooked me of like, here's something cool. And then you can get stronger and you can get better weapons and they do this. And, and then it became like teaching it. Um, uh, helping people get through the raid that couldn't get through the raid in our community or through through PS Nation and and everything like that and it kind of just grew and kind of spiraled out of there to where you know with, with again with my job with being in retail I was tend to be off on a Tuesday that kind of just happened to be how it was and I wake up in the morning and it was reset day and I'd get up and we would do nightfalls when we got the nightfall buff and the aura and we'd do our raids and we'd switch characters and do the raids and things like that and it was kind of like this just this ritual of time that I was spending with these people and like that still to this day can't can't be replaced like i don't care like i know that everybody kind of like makes fun of like when they came out and said like the friend game but like when i'm playing the game by myself it's just not that much fun as it is when you're playing with a friend yeah i agree with you 110 percent on this because the friendships that i've made along the way playing destiny have made it so worth playing and being part of it from day one me and shadow started playing the game together back in i want to say it was july of 2014 during the beta and we were hooked mm -hmm. instantly right away we thought it was such an awesome game and i'll tell you what this was supposed to be the in-between game because we were just finishing up with call of duty ghost we were getting ready to play advanced warfare that unfortunately didn't meet our expectations we stuck with destiny ever since every expansion became a ritual where the night before we would buy the soundtrack on the bungee store because they made it available the night before and we would listen to the destiny music all night as we fell asleep and waited for the next expansion to hit and it was the special times playing through all of the raids for the first time trying to figure out puzzles and where to go and what to shoot and all the different mechanics it's something that i was never able to get from any other game yeah, and it definitely. made it so incredible yeah uh, that goes double for me and the converse we came from like halo I played oh, mostly all the Halo games, and I've played a lot of the Bungie games, because I, I am a Bungie fan, and I have been for as many years, so I know how good the shooting is. Bungie nails the shooting. It's the best in the business, in my yeah, opinion. Sure. Absolutely. And um, just the feel and the look of the weapons, they make them special. The loot feel felt special, and just going and doing the nightfalls every week, doing the raids, and building friendships. I met somebody, one of my friends in Tennessee I, that we used to, that we played with, and we went down to Guardian Con in 2016, when it was actually still called Destiny Con. And uh, that was a lot of fun. And yeah, I can say it's probably the most social game I've ever played. Yeah, my wife definitely is not a huge fan of when content would drop, because <laughs> she would just lose me for like three or four days. <laughs> Definitely, and I've had some of the most challenging moments in Destiny, and I've also had some of the most fun moments in Destiny as well, and I'm pretty excited where Destiny goes as a franchise and what we get in the future beyond just the annual pass and this fall. Um, I'm pretty excited to see where the technology allows for these games to become. Yeah, I mean, they've got a huge opportunity and they have no one else to point the finger at anymore so. I mentioned that in last week's episode <laughs> yeah so uh, it'll be it'll be very very interesting to see what decisions were Bungie decisions and what decisions were Activision decisions I had inclination that Bungie was going to partner up with maybe Microsoft and 
work out some kind of a publishing deal? No, no way. You don't think so? Absolutely not. I'm you, thinking... their, their break from their break from um, Microsoft with the Halo franchise years ago, when they initially bought their independence, was a very big deal to them. They did not. I mean, if you. Um, there's a book. Uh, Jason Schreier of uh, Kotaku uh, wrote a book called Blood, Sweat, Blood, and, Sweat Pixels. and Pixels. Yeah, it's a very, very good book. Um, it talks about that directly, and their their departure and their separation from Microsoft was probably had more fanfare than what their their partnership and separation from Activision just recently had. Um, they did not want to work on Halo anymore. Um, they bought. They 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 purchase themselves away from Microsoft. So I, would, I don't think that they would go back into that deal. Um, and it, obviously it sounds like they have enough money along with that other, that other company that invested in them from overseas. That um, is, that is, yeah, cool. that, it, but that is a, for a separate IP outside of destiny, but at the same time, it still supports their payroll. So it's, it's, it, it's very interesting, but I think that it was, it was very head scratching for Bungie when they did it. Obviously I wasn't as entrenched in the video game industry as I, am now but looking back on it when they their departure from microsoft was met with so much fanfare for them to be independent for them to then run into the arms of activision was very head scratching yeah so i think uh somebody might be holding me some spicy tuna rolls possibly <laughs> by the time e3 comes well, see my my thinking is that phil spencer is a new individual at microsoft there is a new culture um in the entire organization with Sachin adela becoming the ceo and also there being a new upper management taking care of Xbox. So I, I figured because Xbox is a, in a very unique spot, they don't really have that big IP title. Obviously, Call of Duty went with Sony for exclusivity, and I feel like Destiny is in a good place to maybe negotiate some kind of a deal and let bygones be bygones, ironically, right? Maybe figure out a way to work together so that it's a mutually beneficial thing where there's only a publishing agreement in place, but not necessarily any type of copyright uh, ownership being transferred of the franchise. Uh, I mean, the... the I understand what you're saying, and like a lot of people that were surprised when the when Bungie and Activision split, that that Bungie got to keep the IP. But Bungie had had been working on and had owned the Destiny IP well before they ever signed that deal with Activision. Um, That's true. And they, but and and unfortunately, the state of the studio at that time, my belief was that they obviously needed the money to publish the game, and now they feel like they're in a good enough position to where they can self-publish to where they don't. They don't need, nor do they want, a middleman. Um, otherwise, they would have just continued their deal with Activision and not, not broke it. Me personally, I think that this was year eight of their ten-year deal. Um, I think they signed it in 2011, yep. and I th and I think that Bungie went to Activision and pretty much said, D3 will not be ready until 2021 which was outside of their 10-year deal. So at that point in time, there was no mutual benefit to Activision continuing that publishing deal since there probably wouldn't be any physical content that needed to be published. I did not think about that. Wow. wow. That's that's really interesting. I, I <laughs> did not consider that. That's... Wow. Because that Des Destiny 2 was delayed an entire year at least... That was a, a, an, an, an announced That's delay true. of an entire year, and Destiny 1 was held up in courts for a while, and that was delayed also. I believe that Destiny 1 was originally supposed to come out in 2012, and the original contract, 2012 or 2013, and the original contract would have been a new titled game every two years. So, they wanted to get it out in spring of 2014, I think. After it, they they wanted to get it out in 2013, but they then they pushed it to spring, and then they're like, okay, we're gonna fall of 2014. Right. Mm -hmm. And Rise of Iron was never supposed to happen. Exactly. You're right about that. Yeah. Definitely. That's awesome. I didn't. That's very eye-opening, in a way. I'm not saying any of that is fact. That's just my opinion. So. Kind of makes but sense, it, it, actually. It makes a ton of sense, actually. From the release schedule as a developer and a publisher, that makes a ton of sense. Absolutely. Because if they're following the same roadmap that they followed with Destiny 1 with their belief of it's going to take three years and they're going to release some form of Rise of Iron style content this September, October, um, there was never – you could buy like the Destiny collection 
um, on the store shelves, but there wasn't a, you know, like you couldn't walk in and buy Destiny Rise of Iron. It was only like, like they did Destiny and then they did Taken King and Taken King had its own box and box art, but then, then came Destiny the Collection. Um, wouldn't it was not Destiny Rise of Iron, so that was, and I feel like that we're gonna get something very similar to that this this fall, yeah. with possibly another annual pass, which is rumored to be in there somewhere. So. I think you're right about that, mm-hmm. and that would also probably mean D3 fully on next gen uh, Xbox and PlayStation consoles. Now, when that happens, when Destiny Three comes out, do you think we'll come closer to having the cross-play be possible between PC and consoles because of the smaller disparity between frame differences? Um, I don't... Cross-play... I don't know because, like, I know that, like, Fortnite supports cross-play and Rocket League supports cross-play and there's a lot of other games that have been supporting some cross-play and things like that, but... Um, I look at it from a business perspective of cross-play could possibly uh, cause for lost software sales versus like you guys that play on PC and also have friends that play on console. If Destiny 3 comes out and it's playable, cross uh, it's, it's cross-save to where you can level your character up on PC, buy the game on PS4, and then take your character to PS4 and not have to re-grind for everything. For most people, I think that would be worth the 50 or $60 that the game would cost twice. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Versus, if you just allow cross save, then you buy it on P. Or I'm sorry, if you just allow cross play, you guys buy it on PC, I buy it on PS4, and we get to play the game together. And there's no financial benefit from the studios for that. Corn, how many times have we bought Destiny? <laughs> Too many times. I, <laughs> I bought Destiny two maybe like five or six times between buying it for all my friends and buying the collector's edition on PS4, and then buying the copy and the annual pass for the like, PC. So I've put in quite a bit, but it's worth it because I put in almost fifteen hundred hours into Destiny two. I've put in 3,500 hours into Destiny 1. You've put in 5,000. I think we're getting our money's worth here. I'm not complaining about what I spend on the game. I actually very much appreciate it, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to support them as much as I am able to. Absolutely. And my only thing from the business standpoint of I don't know what the cost of cross play would be to incorporate cross play into these servers nor it, or to see if it's even possible. But again, like I don't think that directly announcing cross play would increase sales. Yeah. And it could actually have the adverse effect and decrease sales because if you are able to play with your friends and you're on PlayStation, your friend is on PC, there's no reason for you to get the game for any other platform. Exactly. So their job is to, whether we like it or not as consumers, we have to you know, step back sometimes and think about it from a business standpoint of like it costs money to do these things and what benefit does it give any studio, let alone Bungie, to just say, okay, we're going to sell 100 copies of the game no matter what, and now we're just going to allow 50 people to play against these other, with these other 50 people no matter what. Um, you, know, you, can, you can have a raid team of two Xbox players, two PC players, and two P- PlayStation players, and there's no, and it just works, and that's great, and it's great for the consumer base, but it's not giving them any benefit financially. I don't think it would cause them to, it would cause any version of Destiny to sell more or less if it was viable versus, like, having to to buy it. Like, if I, you know, if I had a PC that could run Destiny 2 right now, and, and I've, I've got plenty of people that play on PC that I know or that I used to play with on PS4 that moved to PC to where I could just incorporate my titan and bring him on to P- on the pc and play the game with my friends i would buy it again if i could buy destiny 2 or destiny 1 on my switch oh man <laughs> oh man i would buy it like 20 times over it would be a done deal you know that's kind of why i got a vita too so i can um do remote play with destiny and destiny 2 on my vita i didn't think <laughs> about that how does how does that work um, it you you have to set it up through the Vita, but there's a way that you can play. You can use the Vita 
as a screen, obviously, and you can connect to your PS4, similar to how Remote Play via PC. And actually, this week through iOS works. They just uh, PS4 just updated their firmware to to support iOS now. That's so pretty you, cool. Where you can connect to your uh, you can connect your Vita to your PS4 over Wi-Fi, and then you can play games the back touchpad serves as your as you can you can map buttons to the screen and you can map buttons to the back touchpad but it's not the easiest thing to play a shooter on but it's they have possible. an adapter yeah i've seen one on ebay it's yeah. like so do something dollars and it literally gives you triggers on the back yeah. and the top so you're yeah. able to play them yeah so it, it is possible that you could you know sign on and you know I'm going to pick one up. <laughs> Go do patrol or do your flashpoint or something like that. Maybe on your lunch break if you have good Wi-Fi connection at work and at home, you know. I may have to try to pick up a PS Vita now. Wow. And I may have an extra one. Does it run smoothly or how, how does it run? Um, I haven't remote played Destiny 2. Uh, Destiny 1 did okay. Um, to be honest with you, I probably haven't. I don't even know where my Vita is in my house somewhere. It's in my bedroom somewhere probably um but uh so i just haven't used it recently but the there was some some like remote play worked really well at the very beginning um and it still works well like you, especially like on pcs and stuff like that i see a lot of people remote playing on pc because you can just plug a dual shock into your pc and it just works so i will have to definitely look into that wow pretty cool i don't really think you could do like a raid <laughs> like i think you might have some problems but I can I can only imagine playing a raid in portable Bog, mode. Man. <laughs> Play Bog and beat us. <laughs> hey, it would be perfect for the new Gambit mode. It's about a 10-minute match now. You can stake uh, pretty much made it into a single round activity. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, but Dave, what are you most excited about with uh, the new season of The Drifter? Um... I just want to see if there's going to be a gameplay loop that brings me back to to playing. Like Forsaken took a huge step in the right direction to bringing me back on a right on a very regular basis. Um, but you know, like the Black Armory, I kind of did the things and I got what I wanted from it and got certain roles that I wanted and I kind of walked away. Like this week is the first time like I put any kind of significant amount of time into Destiny since um, the end of like since when No Iobi Labs and stuff came out. I kind of took a I played a little bit for. Um, Crimson Days, but I had I had taken you know time off. Not necessarily like a hundred percent Destiny's fault. I had a lot of coverage to do for reviews and some other things were coming up, and I had a lot of trips and you know things like that. But you know I just kind of missed the the daily engagement of you know uh, things to do in the game, and it's always important for me for those to be there. So. It's always nice to come back to Destiny and after taking a break because. You don't get as frustrated with the things that are not going well with the game, and you can come back to it with a fresh mind, and it almost feels like, you know, you're not doing the same thing, because they are only able to release so much with each content release, and I think that's why we're getting three content drops instead of two, because they just weren't able to keep up with the demand of what each expansion was going to require of them and it was still not good or what the community content. expected it to be so yeah. yeah i mean this is like a really great value for like if you take the the value uh proposition you know from that standpoint and look at all the content that they're packing into this um dlc uh, i mean the, the content can, like the stuff like that can be like debatable i mean the the fact that it's you know like it's it's very gambit centric um and if you're not somebody that enjoys gambit like this could be like right now like this first week you know like it could be something that could be a little bit problematic for some people but um the fact that they're they're continuing like they're hitting on that promise that they made when when christopher barrett did that state of the game address right after in like right after curse of osiris came out and and came with like the negativity of it of where they were saying that they were going to double down on the end game and black armory and this have proven that they are doubling down on the end game <laughs> right 
And it also goes to show you with the invitations of the nine that they're bringing and the allegiance quest and the revelry event that's free for all players and the arc week and some other surprises. I'm sure there's definitely surprises that they haven't told us about yeah. in this. Yeah, and I think part of the reason why they're not giving us all of the content in one lump sum is because they want to discourage players from just... Oh, they would just destroy it in like three days. Yeah. Like... Exactly. Much playing for 36 hours because there is a pretty big streaming streaming community, and once they beat it, it's like, okay, well, there's nothing else to do. So I understand they have to. They want to have longevity. Yeah. Yeah. Now I do understand it from that perspective. For me personally, I'm really enjoying Gambit, uh, especially now more than I did before, because I think that some of the gripes that I had with Gambit they were able to resolve. I think that the matches lasted way too long and they addressed it because of the, uh, the third phase being a uh, primeval rush uh, mode. So I think that was a good idea, them adding more spawn locations that prevented some of the unfair spawn trapping that existed in the game and, and some of the things that existed with the sleeper stimulant, if you guys remember that. Queen Breaker. <laughs> and Queen Breaker. Queen Breaker, yeah. yeah so... I can relate. So for me, the first uh, expansion didn't quite do it for me, although I really liked Blast Furnace. It's still one of my favorite pulse rifles that came out of that. And for a $10 expansion, I guess I can understand the value that we got in it personally, although this one is definitely a lot more interesting to me although we didn't get everything in one go as far as content goes i'm really excited to see that there's a lot more lore that's being promised to us with this expansion and also we have multiple exotic quest lines that we get to play and some of the new modes that we don't even know about that will be coming out in the coming weeks so i'm pretty excited to check all of that out yeah, no, I mean it's 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 very interesting in terms of how they're trying to drip feed the content to keep the to they're trying to get people to sign in weekly and stuff like that and they I think they learned a lot of lessons this year um, with especially even with Black Armory so we're seeing those power surge bounties that were incorporated into the game which are which is a great idea of like maybe playing for like 90 minutes and getting granted it's a bunch of blues but you're getting 640 power to where you can start infusing things or you can wear those and then play the current content with people and not feel like you're like I can't play Destiny because I'm only 580. Right. And the story things that they're dropping, these little lore bits, like these previews that they had right before the Drifter, um, see the Drifter happened on their blog. It's it's really cool the way they're setting up the story because the Drifter's story is very fascinating because he's so close to being like uh, running with the darkness. And everything because I mean the guy has a big ball on his ship that's filled with taken <laughs> yeah. Dave what are your thoughts on the annual pass model overall and the new season of the drifter that we just got um the they the, it always seems it feels like it's a moving target like we you go all the way back to, to to base destiny then when we got destiny and then in that september or that that winter we got um crota's end or will of crota i can't remember what it was called yeah crota's end crota's or end, dark, yeah. dark below yeah dark below. dark below was yeah that was it. so then we then we got dark below and then we got house of wolves and like house of wolves is what brought all the pvp centric things to it it brought us prison of elders and then taking king came out and then we got nothing so that year two of Destiny was Taken King, it was the raid, it was the hard mode raid, it was the challenges, it was a couple of live events, SRL was sprinkled in there, and then it just kind of went dark and it fizzled out. And then all of a sudden in May and June, you start hearing about Rise of Iron, they're doing all these cool things, and, and then you get Rise of Iron, and we get the raid, and we get hard mode, and we get, you know, a couple of challenges, and then it fizzled out, and then they started the hype on D2. And then with D2, they got they went back to the original expansion model of like curse of osiris was almost deemed to be worse than you know dark below and then war mine was a step in the right direction and then you know now we came back to forsaken and then with forsaken they wanted to show that like, continuous content thing and the way that they felt that they could do that was through the annual pass um 
and it's hard to tell because they had problems with seasonal content and the player base grew with putting it on PC and people are like, well, wait a minute, you took certain things away from me that, you know, like, and it was just, you know, and they made their mistakes of like increasing the nightfall level and, you know, Iron Banner can't be played, but it was all the stuff that was in Destiny 1 that came into Destiny 1 over time that was considered to be part of the expansions or part of the new years of content all of that was put into destiny 2 and then when curse of osiris came out and people were like well, i'm not too sure you know like i don't really see the end game right now and now you want me to spend money but now i can't play iron banner and i can't do the faction rally and i can't even do the nightfall that i paid for and i can't play trials yeah. Before, it went, before it went away so they made a lot of mistakes and they had to backpedal and try to clean those up and now you you're getting you know seasonal s content where people are benefiting that don't necessarily own the annual pass um of some of these changes but then some people you know like then other people have other things to do so it's just a it's a weird dynamic that they're in right now and i don't know if it it, I, I, it can't be changed right now, so they kind of just have to to go with it. I mean, I'm okay with it. Like, I'm kind of on the same boat that you guys are. Like, I feel like I got my money's worth out of the forges. I feel like um, the you know what came from you know the stories and Niobe Labs and things like that. I the, the, I feel like those are all fine, and that's what they were supposed to be. And this new evolution on Gambit, I wish that they partially i guess like the little bit that i played i wish that they had not separated gambit so it's in like two different modes now which i think is a little weird in terms of they they thought of something with gambit originally and it was a great idea and the the play testing and things like that that they did the time that i got to play it um at e3 before you know well before it came out i got to play gambit but i got to play gambit in a vacuum with a control environment of the weapons that they gave me and the subclasses that they gave us to play with and I wrote a piece on it, and I wrote that this is game changing, and this is this is this is the legs that Destiny 2 needs to continue to play. But that was before the new subclasses were coming out. The you know the, the um, Icolus. Uh, we didn't really know how dominant Icolus shotgun was, and Well of Radiance, and Sinso thefts, and melting points, and things like that. But none of that stuff was in control. And all of a sudden, you're against a, a, a stack of four, and you just get decimated in Gambit because they can kill their boss in 10 seconds. You know, yeah, and yeah. people had like you know, worries about that on Fire Team chat, I believe. And when they, you know, interestingly, if you look at Gambit Prime, in a way, they kind of solved that issue as far as being able to just melt the boss because you have to go through stages where you have to kill the primeval or kill the uh. The envoys. The yeah. envoys before you're able to do damage on the boss, and then you get this buff that allows you to do more damage on the primeval boss, and then you can kill it. And I have seen situations where a team was way behind in moats, but even so, because the opposing team wasn't able to take down their primeval strategically enough, we were able to catch up and win the match so it didn't feel like if you're losing you're not even going to win so what's the point of even making an effort yeah but how long do you think that that's going to last it it really depends on what they do with it and if they add more maps to it i think if they add more maps if they deep six is coming next week. yeah we're getting another map this week this weekend i believe so, but my concern is, have you seen um, a little bit that's been going around on YouTube and stuff like that? Have you guys equipped Warcliffe Coil yet? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's deadly. And they're already two-phasing them. They're, they're essentially just hitting the boss with kinetic uh, ammo, like with primaries right now in the first Envoy set. And then the second one, they all have like six or eight shots of a coil, and then the boss is just deleted. Yeah, I watched that glad video. Yeah, so um, you know, and it's not just him. You know, like obviously they they you know uh, Clan Redeem is is obviously very elite at what they do and things like that. But um, it won't take very long before people understand that and stuff like that. And I think that you look at you know where, where there's they they sit there and they try to balance exotic power weapons and legendary power weapons. And I know like we might talk about the balance changes and stuff like that later. But they take uh you know. They nerf Sleeper into the ground. They, you know, whether you want to, you know, like they, they took Sleeper out of Gambit because it was a problem. They're trying to take Queenbreaker out of Gambit because it's a problem. But now you have Warcliffe Coil in a PVE environment doing 160% additional damage. 
<laughs> it's like fixing one problem, but you're introducing a whole new problem. So in one K in in one K voices now buffs you all guns equipped by twenty five percent inadvertently. I'm sure that'll get fixed, but you know, like it's just like these things where it's like you. I don't. I'm not necessarily saying that I want a balanced game. I don't expect a balanced, boring game because that's what a that's what a game a balanced game is is boring. That's the crucible that we got at the very beginning of D2 was a very balanced, boring crucible, and it showed. Yeah, and, right about that. Um, you know, with all these changes and everything they've made to it, but I I feel like there's just certain scenarios where we already knew that Warclip Coil was a good gun. And, and, a, and a good option, whether it was PvP or, you know, ad clearing and PvE and stuff like that. And now, like, the catalyst that you can have on it that allows your rockets to cluster tighter and you give it a damage buff when you're trying to make legendary power weapons more relevant, that's just, it's just not happening. That makes a ton of sense. And it kills invaders fast. Because <laughs> it already does well in PvP. Right. I mean, I like how the invasions can swing the matches now, though. So, yeah, I mean, like, it guarantees, like, one invasion. Like, you, you, they, they stop the one cycle, which is very good because it does, you know, it gives you, it, you know, it gives you a chance, like you guys mentioned, like, there is a catch-up mechanic. The, your blockers, like, um, sucking, you know, like, taking moats out of the bank is a very interesting thing to where, you know, you have to have somebody pay attention to the blockers. And the Gambit Prime that we're playing right now, like, I'm really kind of holding judgment out because, like, you have to see what happens after tier one tier two and tier three of the of reckoning are out and these these uh, these classes are there to where somebody can you know i think one of them says abilities. yeah like you you can if staying near the bank it triggers health regeneration there's um the sentry can you know get multi-kills and then have up to times five to do extra damage to take him so you know like i think that you know like the the, the moat collector the collector class can collect 20 moats and while and send a like, huge blocker yeah. over and yeah. while he's collecting moats, every time he picks up a moat, he gets an overshield. Oh, I didn't see that one. Yes. Yeah, so, so like, as you're collecting moats, you pick up, you you start to build an overshield. So like, you could have your slayer out there, like sh you know, using a scout rifle, using an auto rifle, using a you know heavy machine gun, clearing ads, and your collector running along the edge of the map, scooping all these moats up, picking up an overshield at the same time. All of a sudden, he has 20 moats, and then. You know, there's the other team sends one or two blockers, and your your sentry takes care of the blockers, and the bank's open. And he drops 20 moats in there, and he just goes back and swings it around and does it again. And then you have the, the your invader just waiting for the portal to open. All of a sudden, you know he's you know you drop in two sets of 20 moats in there, and they drop you know, and then the the portal opens. You know, this would be interesting for tournaments. Yeah, and the, and the private matches that they're bringing will, you know, it could cause some of that and, you know, things like that. But it, it's, again, it's 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 a definition of, like, Destiny kind of almost running, like, 99 yards and stopping because there's not something that you queue into that you're going to run this class because, like, it it might be frustrating in Gambit to, to – they joke about it in the Vidoc, but, like, I don't want to play Gambit with four people that are built for invading. Mm hmm <laughs> Yeah. Like, I don't, but I don't want to play Gambit with four people that are built for collecting either, because you're going to be fighting over moats. Yeah. So it's going to be one of those things where solo queuing would be a challenge, you know. And I'm not, you know, I'm not expecting them to, to, you know, figure it out. I love the, you know, I've, I'm an advocate of for non matchmaking. Um, I know we haven't really talked about it much at all yet today, but you know, the playing the reckoning, like solo queuing into the reckoning, kind of sucks. <laughs> what do you think, Corn? I think that it's the reckoning activity almost feels kind of like playing one of the forges when they first came out because you would queue in by yourself and it almost felt like the other players didn't really know what to do. There was no coordination. Almost like if you're playing a Gambit Prime match um, on, on Tuesday, it almost felt like, okay, unless we had a full team, Half the people just didn't know what they were doing, and it was a frustrating experience. And I, I don't know what the answer is to fix that. And to we, uh, we got tier two coming tomorrow. Yeah, but so, what power level is that going to be at? A six seventy. They've said that. Yep. Yep. And tier three is going to be six ninety. And what power level are you guys right now? I am six fifty two point five. So how do you think you're going to feel tomorrow? Horrible. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to grind after the podcast. Right. 
Uh, I may have to play a few raids to grind out some of that, some of the powerful engrams that I have. Luckily, I've only gotten a chance to play through... Uh, well, I grinded out to get the Oxygen SR3, so I didn't really get anything beyond a Nightfall Power Engram, and I think I turned in five of the uh, raid keys for the last wish, trying to get a thousand voices, but still, I cannot get it after about 35 attempts now, so hopefully I get it within the next couple tries. That would be awesome. Uh, especially with how broken it, it is in uh, Gambit. <laughs> it would be fun to test it out and uh, have some fun with it. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's just an interesting thing. Like, you're bringing something out three days later that's essentially uh, a raid level, a raid l- level like power thing that, but you're also, like, if you, once you complete that initial quest with the Drifter of doing your weak motes in your, um, in your bank, I can't think of the thing, the name of the thing right now. Synthesizer. Um, synthesizer. Yeah, you can't make. You, I mean, you can keep making weak modes, but those are always going to be like a plus one drop, like a you right. know, like a gambit ability plus one. So in order for you to start getting plus twos, like you know, need this, the blue bank. We need this yeah, one. you need the blue, and it needs to be six seventy. Like I can't like, so I, I don't think I would go into, um, into that content without a group of three other friends of mine that I can communicate with and, and work together to, to complete that because it's probably going to have a different mechanic too it's, it probably will Yeah. Cool. and you know another option that I often choose to take is I go into a uh, LFG community if I can't find s- someone in my clan who's looking to play or if Shadow Price is on I can go on LFG and sometimes you'll be surprised you can meet some pretty cool people along the way and there are quite a few communities out there for finding people to get a more coordinated group to play some of the more coordinated activities that would be considered more of endgame because I'm pretty sure tier 3 of the reckoning is going to require for you to have a full team working together and that's kind of an intended thing for them to make it feel like an end game activity and I'm sure the drops will hopefully uh, reward us accordingly with the efforts that we put in yeah um I mean my only concern with that is like so you you compare you know the reckoning to the forges and the forges were an easy enough and essentially an easy enough concept once you were on level with or even a slightly below level with to figure it out there strategies that were figured out you know you had to throw the you know throw the the orbs into the into the forge and get you know clear waves of enemies and things like that but it'll be interesting to see how diverse the mechanics are in the reckoning because with public matchmaking i think when you do public matchmaking i think you have you cannot have elite level mechanics in public matchmaking like could you imagine trying to do to shoot riven's eyes with public matchmaking yeah i mean the interesting thing that I, that i see that they're doing is they're changing the modifiers every day i do like that it keeps it a little tr- fresh keeps it more fresh in my opinion yeah no i mean the modifiers are good like but then i think that they kind of destiny has somewhat trained their community to not necessarily pay attention to the modifiers as as much. I mean, void burn help, you know, void singe helps, but it not as much as it. It's not as impactful as it was in Destiny One when it was void burn. When you know, like I'm still as a Titan, I'm still running hammers and melting point because the DPS is better than any void ability that I have as a Titan. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you make a really good point, Dave. It does make sense that if you're going to introduce matchmaking into an activity, then you have to make an activity where you are able to sustain that. Maybe not so much on day one because you're learning the new mechanics of whatever you're playing, so it's going to be a little challenging. But after that first hump, you want to be able to just go in it and everybody knows what to do and you're able to just go in and beat it. For something that's going to be considered endgame, maybe for them not to have matchmaking would make more sense. So maybe have tier 1 have matchmaking, but then tier 2 and 3 be only available if you have a full squad of 4 people, for example. Or they need to add some kind of filter system where it allows you to select light levels that you're looking for. 
Okay, I like that. How do you and think a mic. They would, how do you think they would be able to accomplish that effectively? I think it's there's other games that have done it before where you just have filters. Um, you have you know like you have like there just like you, yeah. yeah, just like you set up a private match like oh turn heavy on, turn heavy off, turn special on, turn mayhem on, turn mayhem off, like okay. light level you know five six you know six forty or six you know six fifty microphone yes I mean you you can obviously like can't make somebody talk you know but at least that you know that they could possibly hear you. Yeah, because there was a those kind of filters on the old LFG, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I mean, they, and some LFG sites still have those kind of things where you can, you know, you can list certain things that you want and stuff like that. And I know that, you know, part of the the weapon balancing and everything that came was they were tired of hearing, you know, must have Gallowhorn and things like that. But, you know, at the same time, like that's going to happen like regardless you know because it's already you know like fighting riven in lfg if you look at some of the lfgs like must have black spindle or whisper the worm sorry must have whisper you know even fighting the you know the, the scourge of the past boss you know must have thunderlord must have whisper like there's there's requirements or there's people are still asking for you know ridiculous things like must have 25 completions to i want to i want to speed run my raids you know and that was something that i always like i tried to get away from um mm-hmm when I was helping people with raids or helping people kill Skullus for as many freaking times as I, as I beat Skullus and help people beat Skullus. I think in the month of August that year for moments of triumph, I, I, me and my friend Johnny put Skullus down 60 or 70 times. Wow. Wow. That, that was an encounter in the beginning. I'll tell you. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, and it's, it's just an interesting thing that where like, you didn't need certain things. Like I, I, you, you, you relied on your friends. Like I knew, like I knew what Johnny was going to do when I needed him to do it. And, you know, and I could we could carry a third person, but they still had to carry their weight. Like, I never really let anybody just not do anything. Um, and they they became better. And the, the thing that I think Destiny 2 is lacking is and they've 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 overcorrected it is that there's nothing. And that's part of the reason I really haven't beat Scourge of the Past, because other than threat level, there's really no weapon I want from there that I have to have. There's no there's no fate bringer. There's no, you know, oversoul edict. There's no, you know, black hammer and you know, hunger of crota. Like there's none of that anymore. Yeah. The raid weapons don't really feel quite as special, and maybe making thousand voices more powerful will inadvertently make it that pinnacle weapon that it was intended to be, I hope, because that was ultimately the best weapon you can obtain from the most challenging activity at the time that Forsaken came out, which was the last wish raid. But even then, like, it, it was, it used to be the, you know, I'm chasing Gallahorn because I need it to, to help. It, it doesn't, it wasn't like a must have for content. It but it was, <laughs> yeah, but it helped. It, it helped you get through content better, you know, if you had it and things like that. Like, if you're shooting six Gallahorns, and I know that the concern of, like, weapons and light Gallahorn can't be the only option all the time, you know, and but it's it's turning into, you know, Well of Radiance and, you know, whatever else. Well of Radiance, war, today, this week's meta is Well of Radiance, Warcliff Coil. You know, and it, it, it'll it change, obviously, and it can change. Um, and that's why I like they ch- that they changed so many things in the patch notes. There, there's so many things that they changed to try to, you know, rebalance things. So, I mean, yes, as strategies are going to adopt. People are always going to find the easiest way to do things and the fastest way. It's just, you know, the nature of the beast. Well, and, and I'm okay with that. I mean, I did the, you know, I, I killed Crota standing on the ledge. You know, with the, the Titan popping the bubble on the edge, and I killed Atheon with doing the bubble, bubbles middle strategy on the middle island. Like, you know, like we did all that. You know, we killed Skolas, and you know, we did. You know, we fought orcs, and for a little while, we fought orcs from up on top of the pedestals and things like that. Like, I'm okay with that. Like those, I feel like that those are strategies, and and having certain weapons there, like, you know, but. I, at the same time, like the, the the time and the effort needs to be rewarded, and and I don't know how to fix that anymore. You know, like like random rolls can't always fix it because my can, my concern with random rolls is, and it's getting it looks like it might be getting fixed a little bit now with um, the content that they release with the new perks. But it was like, oh, random rolls are coming, and like if we don't get unique perks, then everybody's gonna want you know kill clip and outlaw and rampage, which is pretty much what they wanted. So. I think there Bungie is in a really, you know, challenging spot because there's only so much they can deliver to us and so many different changes that they're able to make, whether it be because of the way that the 
core foundation of the game was built or because of the limited resources they have because they are obviously working on the next thing that they're going to be releasing you know in the fall and hopefully down the road after that and destiny 3 so they have a really delicate challenge to balance you know the player base today but also make sure they're staying on course with what they're doing for the next release and the release after that because that's always on the mind of game developers and that's part of you know releasing content that we can all enjoy playing now more than ever in that studio because they they're working on three big three releases basically like season of opulence well that's vicarious visions i forgot they're doing that one season of opulence but yeah obviously they're working on stuff for the fall and destiny 3 like we know luke smith and his team are working on destiny 3 so it's yeah. that's a foregone conclusion before we dive into the patch notes um i do want to ask dave what is your favorite game on the PlayStation of all time? Uh, it's it's probably Uncharted 2. I like think that's the one that kind of, you know, like got me, you know, into back into playing games at the time like for for a little while. Um, I played Uncharted 2. It was yeah, it was two, and then I played three, and then I went back and played one. So that's the. I mean, I'm saying Destiny, it feels like it just feels like a big cop out. It's the game that I put the most time into over the last couple of years. But I feel like the games that, that has the most impact with me is, is the Uncharted and Un- Uncharted Two in particular, and then the Uncharted series. That is like an action movie, like <laughs> through and through. Like, what story is really cool. I, I I like that game a lot myself. I'm still working through it. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. The storytelling and the, the the Indiana Jones meets Tomb Raider, you know, like all that stuff. So, mm-hmm. I know Shadow Price has uh, Metal Gear Solid, right? That's your favorite game for the PlayStation. That is, that yeah, is I, can, my, I can never get into those. Like I tried. That is my favorite game of all time out of all consoles. Is uh, Metal Gear Solid? Yeah. I'm. I was a Zelda kid, though. I mean, I'm 35 years old, like I said, and like Link to the Past had a huge impact on it with me i've got a brother that's 10 years older than me and and playing video games with my brother and i'm I'm just a sports fanatic sports junkie like mlb the show and tecmo baseball and super tecmo bowl and like maddens and and when the ncaa football games were out and you could build dynasties and recruit and have private leagues and online dynasties and stuff like that like i was just a huge sports junkie still same same yeah i remember when i had mlb the show i wanted i think it was 2012 i played that for a whole summer one year Do you guys remember NBA Jam? Yeah. Oh, I, oh yeah. Absolutely. That was, that was that was a lot of fun. I remember playing that in the arcades when I before it came out to the consoles. Yeah. And having a lot of fun with that. Now, you mentioned Zelda. Have you played Zelda Breath of the Wild, Dave? Uh, I do not own a Switch. Oh, you don't? Okay. No. It's probably going to be in the future. Um, I have a three-year-old, so, like, I'm sure it's going to, you know, eventually happen and stuff like that. Um, it's just kind of one of the things where with the Switch, I was in a little bit of the wait-and-see mode, and then, like, now, like, right now, I'm like, okay, I see what I want, you know, Breath of the Wild and Mario Odyssey and some of these other big games and stuff like that, and, like, I see what I want, um, but it's just going to be a matter of when I can get it. I'm kind of waiting for I the Switch 2.0 version is probably coming out, which might drop the original price of the regular of the older switch and that might you know because i don't really care about like form factor or anything like that i probably will never use it as a handheld i'm not a huge handheld gamer guy um so like the form factor of like the, the first switch is fine for me but it's it's on my list like i the breath of the wild is one of the first is the first zelda game that i have had not beaten within a year of the game coming out i mean i even had like skyward sword and stuff like that on the wii and all that stuff so that's cool yeah, and periodically they have some pretty good deals on uh, Nintendo Switch. You can get one for as low as, I think I've seen it for like $230. So if you're ever interested, I can maybe shoot you a link uh, on Twitter. If you're yeah, I'll have, to, I'll have to check it out. I mean, I'm hoping for some kind of price drop on the holidays, maybe to get it around under 200 maybe. You know, but it's also, I know it's a Nintendo system, so like they don't go down in price that often. Yeah. We got our Nintendo Switch on day one with uh, Breath of the Wild and it it's one of the most incredible games that I've played uh, besides it, Destiny of course for me 
It sold the Switch. I mean, it, it's it, all that was there at launch. It's one of the best. It's one of the best was, launch games of all time. It was the only game that launched yeah. with it besides crickets. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe they sold more copies of the game than they sold consoles, which was the they funny did. thing yeah. in the beginning. The whole yep. situation. Well, it was on. It was on Wii U, right? Yes, it's it, on Wii U. It did come yeah. out for the Wii U as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what are your thoughts on games like Anthem, Apex Legends, and the upcoming The Division too? Um, I have Anthem. Um, I've played. I've completed the campaign of Anthem. Um, it's good. It's a lot of fun. It's a different dynamic to it. Um, it's. I feel like the the loot pool in Anthem is a little shallow. Um, it's again. It's the same thing. It's the return on investment for me. Of like, why am I doing something to you know to hopefully get stronger? And you definitely feel like you get stronger in Anthem. What I don't like about Anthem right now, other than the connectivity issues. Um, and that's beside the alleged breaking of consoles, like they, whatever. Like that's there's bigger problems with your system if it's than just Anthem. Anthem is not causing your PlayStation to to die. Um, but uh, um, my thing with Anthem is that you can get the same ability at a level five and a level fifteen, a level twenty five and a level thirty, or or at a masterwork or a legendary level, and it just has a couple of other percentage rolls. It's a it's a build game, but the problem that I have with it is that you find out what you like and what works well for you and what combos well for you, and you could stick with that ability. Like you might not get the roll you want, but then eventually, if you complete challenges, you can just get enough materials and continue to craft things. I understand what they were trying to accomplish i just don't like it because i don't think it changes your it changes anything up you know it's just like oh i just want this in a blue level and now i have it in a i i now i have it in a, in a purple level and a yellow level and you know and and then it has the extra 300 damage to this which is fine like if you're trying to to build something around that but i just don't feel like that has the longevity to it um i respect apex i've played it a few times with with one of my co-hosts and a couple of my friends and stuff like that. I'm just not a really big Battle Royale guy. I love the Titanfall feel to the game. Um, and um, I'm very intrigued about the continuation for, Div for Division 2. I got extensive hands-on time with that uh, a couple weeks ago um, that I wrote up on our site for. Um, I'm more interested in this in the story, uh, the continuation of the story of the outbreak in DC and things like that and how they're going to to move that along and I'm but I'm also still concerned about their end game as well because even in the private beta we got to play you know like a couple end game missions and it, it just feels very you know it's again it's match made end game content so the mechanics aren't aren't deep um, I obviously I haven't seen their eight player raid or anything to that extent yet so I can't I don't really know anything about that but it's, I'm just it's going to be fun, and you know, I, I reviewed Division 1, and I played it, played through the story, enjoyed it, loved it, got to a point where they hadn't released any of the additional content, um, more, longer endgame content, and I stepped away from the Division, and I never went back. Um, so... I'm really gonna be curious to see how they can, you know, like this episodic stuff that they're, you know, they're they're teasing and showing and the um, early access to it, or you know, having it be free, you know, to, to all players, it be free is is interesting. I just hope that it can deliver. Um, Anthem needs to to produce prestige and game content quickly. May is too late. Their cataclysm cannot come in May. It needs to come before then. <laughs> Yeah, um, I know you've touched on it, on you know Anthem and its connectivity issues, and seem to be shutting down people's PS4s. Like, I mean, not everybody's having the bricking issue, but a lot of people are having the crashing issue. Yeah, no, it, it's 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 set my console to the blue screen multiple times. But to be fair, Destiny has before as well, but just not Anthem is doing it much more often right now. Right, and I'm just wondering what could it be in that game that's doing that? Everything. Frostbite. <laughs> oh, it's running too. There's too many things going on. Like, or Bioware is not as comfortable with Frostbite as as Dice is. You know, because EA forces. I mean, that's my opinion. EA forces Frostbite on their studios. So it's like a coding problem. Absolutely. Like it's just not you know not comfortable with the depth of the of the engine and things like that. Um, 
could be, you know, because you look at something, it, it's a lot of people like, oh, it's EA. I'm like, yeah, well, Apex doesn't cause my system to crash. Right. <laughs> Apex, Apex is not on Frostbite. Correct. It's not on Frostbite because Respawn, it's, it's, it's hard to believe that Respawn was working on that before EA purchased them. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of demanding textures in that game. Yeah, the game is gorgeous. Like, it's in, and, you know, but... Uh, too much for me the pacing in the game is, is problematic like um too much load screens and people are like well you have all these load screens in destiny I'm like yeah but at least in the load screens in destiny i can mess with things and change things and delete things and read things and right you know, and and a, just looking yeah. at a screen waiting for the progress bar to go across <laughs> yeah i have some more thoughts but i want a corn to get in um, here and... from from my knowledge as far as the frostbite engine the games that run on frostbite are battlefield 5 fifa 19 and madden nfl 2019 battlefront battlefront battlefront, battlefront, two. battlefront 2 yep there's i mean there's an, a lot of games over the years but and do, pretty much any new ea game yep yeah Anthem, yep. But I expect a drama. I, I think what Anthem is doing in terms of its its open world feel versus what FIFA does in a closed environment that loads into the stadium that you're playing in, or Madden that loads into the stadium that you're playing in. Um, you know, Death and Battle, Battlefield Battlefield is, is Dice, who develops Battlefield, has been working with Frostbite the longest. Has, yeah. Have these issues impacted PC gamers at all? I don't think so. I don't think I heard of it. No, any I don't reports. think that it's crashing people's PCs. I mean, they've had a lot of they had a lot of connectivity. sound issues. Yeah, they've sound had a lot of connectivity. Of they've had a lot of sound issues. Their their week zero didn't go very well either. <laughs> yeah, I just I don't understand how they were able to release that game in that you know fashion and everything. You know, I get it. Bugs happen all the time, but this is a triple A game. But it's almost inexcusable. In a, in a uh, okay, and my counter to that would be: How did Rocksteady release uh, Arkham Asylum or Arkham City? Okay, touche. I know what you're talking about. I know what you it, mean by that. It was crushing PCs. Like it was just destroying them. It was a horrible port. I yeah, agree. you're right. You know, so it's just kind of one of those things where I, whatever whatever they sent to quality control got through yeah. Sony's or through all these people's quality controls and something happened within a patch. I will give credit to Bioware and EA though. They are patching the hell out of that game rapidly. Yeah. I mean, they're like, Oh, there's a problem with loot. And we think there's a problem with crafting. We're hearing your feedback on Reddit and we're going to fix it and we're going to reduce it. And the counter to that is that destiny is like, yeah, we're looking at these things. And you know, we know it's, it's, it's Halloween 2018 and one eyed mask is a problem. And now we'll have one eyed mask fixed by Easter. <laughs> Hey, we got it done. <laughs> so it's like, you know, like, no, I, I, I appreciate that opinion. And um, I just wanted to get your feedback on that. So, yeah. And I'm, I'm pretty sure they did refund uh, players who purchased that Batman game for the PC. They did. And they are also doing that for Anthem players. The PlayStation is actually refunding players. So for some some players, Sony has like a one-time forgiveness thing, and if you've never really used your one-time forgiveness, they can you can you know like you can say hey this thing is causing my system to mess up, um, you know this that or the other, and they've started they have issued some refunds I've heard, but there are some people that have attempted to get refunds when they heard about this and are unable to like you can't like I just don't like it like you can't get that refund. So. Right. It's so it's so it's case by case basis. That's it's, my it's, understanding. Yeah. It's got to be frustrating for Sony, though, you know, for this to happen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, full disclosure, like, I didn't pay for my copy of Anthem. EA sent it to me. Um, so, like, I, I'm not sitting there. I'm re I, re I will review it on my podcast. Um, and, and they sent us multiple copies, and another one of our writers is reviewing it as well. Um, so, like, there are things that, you know, I need to disclose. Like, I don't – I haven't paid for Destiny in a long time. <laughs> hey. 
<laughs> that's the perks. Those yeah. are the perks. <laughs> so, you know, like, I, and, uh, and a lot of people are like, well, you can't really speak to the value. I'm like, well, I can because, like, I understand the value and I understand, like, what it would or wouldn't be. But, you know, like, I'm enjoying Anthem. I just don't think Anthem has the legs. And I think that, you know, Destiny did something, you know, obviously did something very, very unique um, to, to, to engage their player base. And they continue to grow that player base. They've had their ups and downs and they've made their mistakes and they've overcorrected and then then recorrected those corrections and um you know it's it's just hard to tell like i I love that they're trying things um i just wish they would i really just wish they would patch faster yeah yeah i mean they were the triple a game after borderlands basically so the blue game Mm -hmm. and there are some rumors about borderlands which i'm hoping they're true we'll have to wait and see but I'm, I'm really yeah, excited something about it. PAX West. Yeah. Yeah, PAX East. Um, East, yeah. East. Hearing about, yep. Yes, that's that's going to be pretty uh, exciting to to learn more about, hopefully. Now, last thing I want to ask about uh, the whole Anthem um, video game. Do you think that games like Anthem and The Division 2 will give Destiny a chance to exist throughout the next three months before the next big expansion hits? Or do you think the population will drop and continue to drop as these games potentially gain more popularity i think that all depends on with season of oculus whatever this new six-man match made activity is that that has to be on point whatever it's going to be um you know like it, it they you know they tried something new with the forges and making your weapons and the some of the stuff they've done with the dawning you can see um you can see residual effects of the dawning in the season of the drifter with your, um, you know, with your synth, with making synths and your synthesizers and stuff like that. Um, you know, like you can see that the gear set, I think it's also going to matter of like how well this gear, this quote unquote gear set thing is received within the community. If it works, if it's worth wearing three pieces or four pieces, or is it only, is it, is it better to wear one of each piece and, you know, like things like that, like it does it, will it really make an impact in Gambit to where they can see, like they can get data and see how much it's affecting Gambit and then maybe try to incorporate something like that into Crucible to where you almost have a class-based hunter in Crucible or into raids where you have a class-built warlock in a raid that's, you know, like you're, I think you're, you're seeing small, small glimpses of it in this with those new Titan arms that, you know, when you carry a sword as a Titan and you block, you do not use sword ammo as long as you have those gaunt, exotic gauntlets on. So like, you can be doing things like block the prime evil from damaging your your team without you know taking without losing any sword ammo so you can almost kind of be like a tank you know similar to how a colossus does something to puts his shield up an anthem and you res as a player you know like the titan can stand in front of something and block the block the shots and res the player or allow somebody else to res them you know like double down on the warlock's ability to heal and the things like um for the the sentry class for gambit where one of the things that it you know like where it says you know light of the defender like you and nearby ally, allies are granted maximum resilience mobility and recovery while in the well of light that you're fighting in gambit prime um you know like how is that is how impactful is that going to be is it going to be worth it for me to 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 put five pieces of armor on to get that light of the defender buff or to put three four pieces of armor on and use a synth you know how you know to to get that extra plus three points you know is it am i going to be able to drain moats as an invader fast enough to where i can you know like stand at the bank for a second take a bunch of moats before i get sniped you know like is this is it going to change the dynamic of gambit enough to where bungie wants to elaborate on on that that's a really interesting point yeah i think they're trying a lot of things they're trying to see they're throwing things against the wall and see, see what's going to stick and see if they want to keep those things uh and and build on those things further as uh into the new expansions and onto destiny 3 because i'm hearing rumors that destiny 3 is going to have a lot more rpg elements Mm -hmm. well i mean like we've been asking for gear sets for years Mm -hmm. and we're kind of getting them but at the same time like they're reverting back to some of their d1 stuff where you know some people are complaining that you're kind of sacrificing fashion already I have to wear this 
but at the same time, I'm only wearing it when I play Gambit Prime, and it's only Gambit Prime perks. It's kind of going back to Vault of Glass and Dark Below, um, you know, Crota's End armor that gave you Oversoul perks or gave you, you know, extra damage against Vex or extra Oracle da- like Oracle Disruptors. Like, people forget about Oracle Disruptor on Fatebringer. Like, that was a reason, or on the Pulse Rifles. Like, that was a reason to have the raid weapons on in the raid. Like, you killed Oracles faster. You killed the Oversoul faster because you had that weapon on or you had some the, a helmet on that allowed you to do something different and they went away from that and now they're kind of going back to it and some of the player base is like well I don't want to wear that like well it's why you need transmog transmogification then that'll fix it it would but I understand the whole the, the counter to that in the crucible is I want to be able to look at somebody and know what I'm up against right I guess it, it it becomes a point where you can't really please everybody, and you have to, at some point, draw the line between who this game's really for. Because you can't make this game appeal to every single player and make everybody happy with every single update and every single decision that you make as a game developer. You just can't. If they're targeting more of the hardcore player base who maybe want some of the old Destiny 1 elements to come back, like having specific perks and uh, favoring that over style or look, you know, I think that they might end up going in that direction, especially with how grindy the game has become since after Forsaken. And to be totally honest with you, in a first-person shooter, like, I don't care what I look like. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> I care what if it makes me change how I play. Like when when you when you when you have a gun with dragonfly, like a pulse rifle or something with dragonfly, you're paying more attention to your aim. You're trying to hit headshots because you're trying to get that perk to proc, versus it just having like feeding frenzy on it, where it's just I just need to get kills. Like I, you know, like I want things that make you change how you play. I mean, they can always also adapt a system where they have legendary emotes that or legendary ornaments excuse me that you put on weapons and it could be a way that they can maybe even monetize on it a little bit more you know if you want to look a certain way you can but you might have to spend a little bit of silver to get there and if they have enough ornaments for enough of the more popular armor pieces or weapons in the game i think it could be a lucrative way for them to maybe make a little money and sustain the content a little bit more so that it feels like with every season we're getting more to do more things to see maybe a vendor refresh stuff like that yeah no i mean i i agree (laughs) They, they had a good thing going with the ornaments in, in Destiny 1, um, and I feel like they stepped away from that. They had a really good thing going with Escalation Protocol having its own unique weapon set, and they went away from that in Blind Well. So I just, like, they have really good ideas that could just be continued, um, not necessarily even expanded on, just continued. Like if Blind Well had its own um, weapon pool that maybe had a rare chance of dropping um, or had ornaments that would do something that had a rare chance of dropping, it might make the boring activity feel a little less boring. <laughs> I, 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 I want an exotic that. shadow price. <laughs> I love that gun myself, yes. I want an exotic shadow price. <laughs> and I'd like to, for them to bring back the icebreaker. I miss that gun so much. Ah, that's hard, man. Yes. Like, ammo regening. I mean, I would love to see Invective again, too, but like anything that regenerates ammo, like just. It's hard. It's pocket hard. infinity. <laughs> That's what I want. Back to bad juju. Like I'm, I'm terrified of whatever, whatever they do with Thorn. Like I mean, we've seen people have been talking about the perks of Thorn and stuff like that. Like it's going to have a damage over time effect, and you know, like I, I saw some of that content where they asked about, am I going to be able to two tap and run away? And Lars is like, eh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love Thorn. I, I love I love using that weapon. I love when people hate it because it just it, it makes me laugh. I'm okay with laugh. like I'm okay with a gun having its 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 heyday for you know like for, for like three months or four months like the the seasonal content like the amount of stuff that they changed in the sandbox this week like is 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 cool. 
you know, like I think it's it's great. Um, they just need to do it more often. Like I, I feel like we don't I get agree. enough uh, sandbox changes fast enough. Like I agree. Uh, you know, like I'm already seeing a little bit of like Yotin uh, being a problem, uh, whether it's in Gambit or in Crucible or you know, like. And I'm not, I'm not one of these people that wants to call for nerfs and stuff like that. I think there's a difference between balancing the game and nerfing a gun. Um, you know, when something is just a little ridiculous, um, it needs to be looked at and adjusted. And then people freak out about whenever they take Whisper reserve ammo from 20 to nine and like it hits your crits, like. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> it's a skill weapon. It's a skill weapon, absolutely, absolutely. Catch us live every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv forward slash The Destiny Show. If you like the show, please share with friends, subscribe, and hit that notification bell for more Destiny content. You can find The Destiny Show podcast on Apple, Spotify, Google, Podbean, and all major podcast platforms. New episodes available Fridays.